What's offensive? Chewing gum in church? Not bringing your Bible to church? A woman not wearing a dress to church? I mean, do you think that God is offended by those things? You know, I went to China and I was at a church. It was a really legalistic church. And I was sitting in the front row with a friend of mine and I was crossing my leg like this. And the lady at the piano got down from her chair in the piano, came all the way to me at the front row, pulled my leg off of my leg and <laughs> put it on the floor because that's offensive in that church. Now, obviously not from the Bible, but people are offended by different things. And I was even in one um, place in a, a mission and I had a Bible and I put the Bible on the floor. And that was offensive to them because you're not respecting God if you put the Bible on the floor. So when it comes to offenses, people are easily offended. And a lot of things bother people and, and even bother them for God. Have you ever been around somebody and every other word is a this word and a that word? And you're you know listening and, and you're a little offended because you're trying to um, have you know clean mouth. And, and then they're looking at you and they're maybe concerned that you're offended because they know that you're a believer. And so then they say, hey, does this, does this bother you? And, and so it's interesting because as people, we do get bothered. There are things that definitely we get fed up with that, that you know, we've, we've had our limit and we, we don't like it. And we're about to blow a fuse and we'll say, stop, don't do that anymore. Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is one of those God things where God says, stop, don't do that anymore. You know, in the book of Genesis, it talks about that God will not always strive with man. And you can see the long suffering of God that waited in the days of Noah prior to the judgment of God, prior to the flood, as the whole world was doing wickedly, each man according to everything that he thought that he wanted to do. And the, and the world was violent and the world was in wickedness. And so God had that ancient world readied for judgment. And so there is a point in time where God says, you know what? Enough is enough. But at the same time, what about when God doesn't like certain things, but yet you look at the way that he deals with it patiently and you go, wow, that's different than us. You know, the lady that was caught in the act of adultery being brought before Jesus. And, and Jesus handled that so graciously, so lovingly. And um, the, the accusers of hers walked away and Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. You know, I, I will say that Jonah, because, you know, we're going to talk about an issue of sin. And, and dealing with sin in our lives and how our sin affects a church. And we're talking about immorality, a few weeks on immorality right now. But, but Jonah ran away from the call of God. He was called to go to Nineveh and he bought a ticket in the opposite direction. And he was not following what the Lord wanted him to do in his life. But the neat thing in the book of Jonah is it says that the word of the Lord came to him a second time. So the Lord is long suffering, the Lord is patient, and the Lord is just ever waiting for us to hear his voice and to catch on to what's right and to get back on track. So the Lord is not just through with us. The Lord does not just say, I'm finished and that's it. But there is a point in time where either a sense of chastisement comes in somebody's life, a sense of um, maybe wrath comes into somebody's life, where the person has had a hardening of heart and they've, they've really stiffened their neck against God. And so we as believers are actually exhortations in the Bible that we as believers need to watch it, that we don't get a stiff neck, that we don't get a hard heart. You know, I've got this hat on right now. See this? It's my, um, my, my Vans hat. And I, I do wear it. I wear it hiking to, you know, protect this old head here so it doesn't get um, skin cancer. But I, I will say with this, this hat that I wear almost daily, and you guys don't see it on me, um, but I wear this hat and before in churches, if you had a baseball cap on, they would the usher might even come to you and pull the baseball cap off. It's like, hey, don't wear a hat in church. That's offensive toward God. Now, wherever they get these things and what Bible they're reading them in, I have no idea. But the, the truth is, is that man can figure out what's offensive before God. But the Bible very clearly says that there are certain things that if we don't listen to the Lord, we not only ruin our lives, but we ruin our relationship with the Lord. And we can put ourselves at a distance with the Lord 
Or we could put ourselves in a place of foolishness where we find out that we never knew God and he says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. And so we've got to figure out because, you know, a lot of times people just want to talk about the ocean and wonders of his grace, which we need to talk about, but that's all they want to talk about. And they want to just be like, hey, the Lord covers everything all the time, no matter what, he just covers everything. And so even though there's an awesome, majestic, and soul-satisfying truth in that, I will say that they take away the tension as far as the Lord getting bothered by things, or the Lord being angry, or the Lord causing somebody that won't return to him to have a heart and a heart, and they depart from the living God. And so there, there is something else at work, not beyond God's grace, because no one can be beyond God's grace in the fact that there's an abundance of it for them. But maybe they could be beyond a prayer, where at the end of the book of 1 John, it talks about a particular brother and that he sinned to sin, not leading to death. And it's okay to pray for him, but the one that sinned to sin leading to death, it says, don't, don't pray for him. You know, and, and meaning that there could be a time where somebody is just so far gone and so hardened and so like an enemy of the cross of Christ that you just got to commit them into the hands of God. But then the idea is, is you don't want to become that, right? Because, you know, when you hear those words in the Bible like reprobate, that means you've departed from God so badly and you're so caught up in your flesh. Or an apostate, you've gone off into some false belief system and you don't have the simplicity of the gospel anymore. And so you think of, you never want to become a reprobate. You never want to become an apostate. You never want to be a person that is separated from God. And so when, when you think about this, when you read scriptures like today's scripture, we're going to read in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and it's about a man, and this man was offensive. He was offensive to God. And the Apostle Paul had to teach the church how to deal with him. He was a born-again Christian because we see in 2 Corinthians that he did repent. And he returned to the Lord and he went through a, a personal mourning time in his life. And, and I would say that definitely, you know, we do get offended by things in others, don't we? That, that there are things that just, not, I want to say irritate us, bug us, but, it, but, it, but an offense is beyond that. It's something that really hurt us. It's something that really the, the person did not have consideration toward us. And so because they just thought of themselves and they walked all over us in some way, whether small or big, you, you feel this sense of offense. And you know what it means because people hold grudges and people hold bitterness because of offenses. But that particular issue, even though it can be very sinful, you have to understand that God himself is offended. In the book of Matthew, and I, I want to say, because it's in my notes here, and we're going to get into the Bible in a moment, but in Matthew 16, there was a story about Peter, and when Peter was telling the Lord, no, you're not going to go to the cross, Jesus said that you are an offense to me. He, those are his exact words, you are an offense to me. So Jesus, when he walked the earth, he got offended by his own disciple, Peter. So no wonder, you know, people get offended by one another in church. No wonder people get offended by each other in their families or in their workplace because offenses do come but to be careful that you're not the person by which they've come I understand that sometimes there are those that are easily offended and everything that you do or you say could be a stumbling block to them it's potentially misinterpreted misunderstood it's potentially um, something because they're easily hurt that is gonna just you know just bother them make them cry or they're gonna hold it inside and they're gonna blow up in a year you know, over it, and, and you're just like, whoa, where did that come from? And because people hold offenses, and people that hold offenses need to give them over to the cross. They need to pray them out. They need to relax. They need to, um, you know, really take some time and take a walk and, and, and drop their baggage at the, the cross of Christ. And, and, and that struggle of the weight of what somebody's feeling, like they did that to me. Well, that's pride. Because you know what? It's like, who are you anyway, right? And, and so, so the, all of those things are not necessarily easy to get out of. And you might ha need to hand it over to God again and again if you're an easily offended person. But for those people that might be the ones that somebody says, oh, you always offend me. You don't have to be so worried about walking on eggshells around everybody all the time. It's like, oh, because anything I say and anything I do will offend them. You, you still got to be yourself even though you need to be considerate, even though you do need to have understanding and, and know what kind of people are in your life and how to treat people. But 
in this story today, the offense is definitely against God. And I'm going to get into it in 1 Corinthians 5. Believe me, we're getting into it. But I, but I want to say it's against God because when David had sexual immorality in his life and he sinned with Bathsheba and he had her husband Uriah put to death um, in, the, in the, you know, war in the way that he positioned him. And so that way he could have her and, and all this cover up and everything that went on, you know, when he finally did pray a deep prayer, and I'm going to say that prayer was like a year later, um, but when he finally did pray this deep prayer, and, and it was eating at him for a long time, it was churning within him, his own sin, and he said, against you, and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Like he recognized he had offended God more than Uriah who died, more than taking somebody else's wife, more than his own lusts, whatever all those things are that contributed to his sin, he realized, you know what, this was against God. Now, to our actual passage, guys. And I, I will have a couple of scriptures that also bring this into the end times, because I told you when I teach the book of Corinthians, I'm going to um, just find a way to always bring it into the end times. So you'll find a passage, I think pretty much in every study. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it says in verse 1, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife. Now that right there was such a heavy thing because it says to have your father's wife. Now it doesn't say it was his mother. So meaning it was a wife that belonged to his father. Maybe his father was remarried second, third time, maybe more than one marriage. Who knows what the, the story was back then, but he had his father's wife. And it says that the Gentile world, this is a, um, you know, a believer or a, even a Jewish believer, but, it, but it's a believer. And, and in Corinth, it was probably a Gentile believer. But the, the Gentile world around them, the non-Jew, looked at that as an immoral act. That the world around us, even though they seem to not abide by the word of God and seem to do whatever is right in their own eyes, They've still got their sense of morality of what they think, whether it's the ethics the world is teaching them or whether it's just wrong is wrong and something seems really big and really wrong to them and, and there's a consensus. And so that particular thing right there, to have your father's wife was disgusting to them. It was disrespectful to them of your family. It was, it was ugliness. And, and this was a man in the church. I don't know what ministry he was involved in. I don't know if he was in the worship ministry, we'll just say. I don't know if he was in a teaching ministry. I don't know if he was in a food distribution ministry, but whatever he was doing, he was just kind of like, hey, people know that, you know, I've got this, you know, relationship over here and they know that, yeah, she was my dad's wife, but, and, and everybody in the church, maybe, maybe lifting a little eye, you know, hey, what's up with that guy? Um, but, you know, hey, to each his own. And, and so, so the church was very, very tolerant very loving, but, um, but, but loving to their discredit in the sense that they weren't looking at God's word and looking at right and wrong and understanding that something needed to be said. You, you know, there's a story in the Bible of Eli. Eli was a priest of God's temple and his sons were having girls that would come to the gates and the doors of the temple. And then they were um, picking up on them and taking them off and having relations with them. And, and Eli, you know, told his sons, you know, hey, this is not a good thing, what I'm hearing about you. But he didn't really, even though he de definitely told them, he didn't do what was right in the eyes of the Lord of really trying to figure out how to deal with his sons and to stop this immediately from going on to being a blight upon the temple and the people going to the temple being affected by his son's sins. And um, that probably could be a stereotypical thing sometimes of pastor's kids um, bringing problems into the church that um, happens as they, they grow up. Um, and it's very hard, of course, for them because of what the way other people might be looking at them or expecting something of them, even though they're just a born a sinner too. But the, the truth remains is that um, when there's something in your family, when there's something within the church that we see that there is actually scripture that speaks to it and saying this thing ought not be, we need to know, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? How do we keep your church pure? It's your church. I know you'll purify your own church, but you've asked us to do certain things to bring about changes so that way it's, it's the right place. Now, like for instance, let's just say 
um, the children of Israel as they left the wilderness. And they were complaining and they were murmuring and, and oh, Moses this. And, you know, he's, you know, even when he was away getting the commandments, it was like they're complaining about him. And he's just gone so long. And, um, or we, we had, you know, so many good types of food there in Egypt. And now we just got this, this manna out here in the wilderness. And there was all these complaints. And, and we see that God was offended by complaints. God prefers thankfulness. God prefers um, a recognition and an honor to him rather than looking at everything negatively in your life. And so the Lord definitely didn't like that. And, and there were some consequences upon his people as a result of their complaining. Now, in this particular scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, it says that it is actually reported that there was a report that had come to Paul, meaning that it was just so well known and so many people had been talking about it that it was just obvious that this was true because it was it was out there and and so he says this thing has been commonly reported that that i hear that this is going on but he didn't just say a particular situation and a specific situation at first he said that there is sexual that there is sexual immorality among you and so he's saying i have heard that the corinthian church is like this is an old you know 60s or 70s term is, is a swinger place the swinger church you know and and earlier maybe in the 80s and 90s when you'd have a singles group and guys that would just come in to the singles group to pick up on a girl but they weren't really there for bible study you know that they're, they're looking at the church as a meat market and so those kinds of a thing is what the bible is saying here and paul was talking about the corinthian church in second corinthians chapter 12 verse 20 second corinthians chapter 12 in verse 20 okay second corinthians chapter 12 in verse 20 it says for i fear lest when i come i shall not find you such as i wish and that i shall be found by you such as you do not wish therefore be con uh, here's what he says about them he says you're not going to find me happy with you because uh, there if i hear that there's contentions and jealousies and outbursts of wrath and selfish ambitions and backbitings in the church and whisperings about each other and, and conceits and tumults. And then verse 21, it says, lest when I come again, when I come and visit the Corinthian church, he says, my God will humble me among you and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before and have not repented of the uncleanness. And so he was looking for a church that was a church that wasn't walking in sin, but was walking in repentance. It doesn't mean people hadn't sinned, but people took repentance and change of heart and following God very seriously. And, and he says, so God would humble me and I'll mourn for those who have sinned before and have not repented. There's a key right there. You know, I understand some people repent again and again and again and again. And, and then, you know, is it true repentance? Because do they really, you know, have they, have they turned from their wicked way? You know, and God sees and knows all of those things. But I will say, the, the word repent means to return to the Lord and to turn from your sin. And so even if a person turns from it more than one time, but you're sincerely giving it over to God, I, I would say some of the nuances and angles of that that might still be stumbling blocks in your life um, are between us and God, as far as God working out our salvation with fear and trembling in us and, and us working it in that way. So he says... Um, they have not repented of their uncleanness, of their fornication, and their lewdness that they have practiced. And so, I believe that as Christians, what the Bible is teaching us is that our, our practice of faith, our, our practice of following the Lord, includes a life of trying to be like the Lord. That as the Lord is holy, so we're holy in all of our conduct, or at least we're trying to be. And if we're not, then we're repentant and we're, we're seeking the Lord, and we're not just being like the rest of the world without concern. The fact that we need to follow the Lord, and the fact that we need to be an example of being a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And even though it is commonly reported, right, that all of us as believers make lots of mistakes, but I hope it's just as commonly reported that, boy, does that church, when they fall down, get back up off of their face and walk in God's grace and follow the Lord like never before. And, and I, I believe that the Lord is merciful and compassionate and slow to anger. And so let's, let's just hang on to that, okay? 
And then it says um, that, it, and when I say it says, it says in my notes that, you know, there were various levels of sin going on in the Corinthian church. As I had just mentioned to you, that whole list in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 20 and 21. And, um, but the problem with it is rather than mourning over it, they were accepting it. Sometimes they would even agree, the book of Romans talks about those agree with, they, they agree with those practicing such things. And that we have to be careful that we're not in agreement. Have you ever watched a, a video that wasn't the most appropriate? Have you ever watched something on TV that wasn't the most appropriate? Have you ever seen something and did you find your sinful nature agreeing with it? So say it was violence or say it was sexuality, did you find yourself going, yeah, or did you find yourself going, uh, you know, did you find yourself being beaten up over it or did you find yourself being blessed by it? And, and this right here is, I would say, somewhat proof of where your heart is at before God, because there is a tension inside of us between, we'll just say the law, even though we're not under law, we're under grace, but between what is written that, you know, about not fornicating and not committing adultery and not committing homosexuality and not committing all of the lewdness and the fornication and the, um, all the different names that they have in the Bible for sexual sin, licentiousness, um, lust, and impurity, you know, all of those things, all categorized under immorality. And when you look at those, do you just go, well, you know, it's just the weakness of the flesh. The flesh is weak, you know, but the spirit is willing. Do you look at it in more of an excuse type of a way, or do you look at it in the tension way? Well, these are definitely against God. The grace of God is definitely keeping me in check and balance, and repentance is keeping me balanced. And or, or do you find just the grace of God? Ah, God covers it all and he winks at everything. You know, we're in the flesh and he knows that, you know, the flesh isn't going to inherit the kingdom. So whatever we do in our flesh, it doesn't matter. No, it does matter. Because one day we're going to give an account, body, soul, and spirit. It's not just that, well, he saved my soul and that's it. No, you know, one day you're dust and the DNA of your dust is going to be your new resurrected body. And so it really does matter that you are dedicated and committed to him completely as a human being. But in this church, even though it was reported that there was sexual immorality, yet one particular sin stood out in verse one, that it's actually reported that there's sexual immorality among you people. It says, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles. Like it was to such a vile level that there was things going on there that the world wasn't even practicing. And, and so he was kind of speaking that to their fault to kind of wake them up and show them, come on, you guys. And, and sometimes I, I think that when those that are believers backslide, they go for the gusto. I mean, they become more sinful than the rest of the world because they, you know, are trying to get whatever they didn't get before and trying to outdo um, the world and trying to... Um, you know, maybe throw off restraint or something like that. And so, so you know, believers can, can be pretty vile when they sin. And, and so we can be offensive to our community. We can be offensive in the church to others, and we can be offensive to God. And offenses need to be dealt with. And, and those that were not even named among the Gentiles, even those things that were serious sometimes needed a little bit more of a special attention. And that's what this chapter gets into, and we'll get into part two of that next week, even though I'm not done with this message yet. But um, the, the dealing with it was, was a pretty serious matter. Um, Paul asked them to join together in prayer and that his heart, his spirit would, would be with them in agreement regarding that prayer meeting and how they would have to hand this man over to the devil that wasn't repenting. So that way his soul would be saved in the day of Christ Jesus. Now, you know, this report, it says that it was reported among you that there was sexual immorality. Churches do get reports. People do Yelp reports of churches just like they do restaurants. People do, um, you know, Google reviews of churches or Facebook reviews of churches. And, and, and so after a while, as the years go by, a particular kind of a reputation can be out there and people are reading things and people are hearing things. And, um, and, and then sometimes it's just other churches have heard about it or other Christians have heard about it. But this 
particular church was kind of looking past and overlooking things that they might have thought inside are probably wrong according to God's word, but hey, we're all sinners. And so, you know, what's my sin or your sin? And, but there was, there was a level here where it's like, uh, 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 Paul goes, this is definitely um, got to be dealt with. And so if the world looks at us as lawbreakers and we're not, then, you know, and, and they treat us as a lawbreaker. I mean, Jesus died looking like a criminal on a cross next to criminals, right? Well, you know, God has our reputation in his hands and, and he knows who we really are. But if we um, die and we look like lawbreakers, yet we're really following the word of God in our lives, then, um, you know, God's spirit is resting upon us and his grace is on us in that. It says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 15 through 18. 1 Peter chapter 4, okay, toward the back of your Bible. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 15 through 18. It says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer. Okay, brethren. Don't suffer and, you know, go to prison as a murderer. We had a home Bible study that we had before the um, church began. And um, one of the guys that used to go to our home Bible study, he actually hadn't been to it for a few years, but he actually um, became a murderer. And um, so, so this does happen, um, people that are in churches, right? It says, let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief. He, he did go to prison, by the way. Or as a thief or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. I mean, even that's thrown in there. I mean, so we're talking about murderer, thief, and today's scripture, immorality, um, or a busybody in other men's matters. I mean, all these things are bad reputation, right? It says, for the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Now that's verse 17. So 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 15, I just read. And then verse 17 says, for the time is coming that judgment must begin at the house of God, meaning that God will deal with his people. And if it is first to begin with us, then what shall be the end of them that do not obey the gospel of God? Like, like if it seems hard when God deals with us as a church in, with our sins individually that maybe even nobody knows about, but the Lord shines his light on them and, and hopefully the Holy Spirit does shine his light on them, but those things that sometimes you feel that they might only be affecting you can actually be a trickle effect and they can be building upon themselves to create a larger sense of sexual immorality. And so it says that for, for the time is coming that this judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, like if, if God's dealing with us as a church, what shall be the end of them that do not obey the gospel? Like, well, how's he going to deal with the world? Oh, man. You know, when you read the book of Revelation and you see that whole end time sin, you see how he deals with the world. And you're going, well, you know, the world is ripe for judgment. But before the world is judged, God is dealing with the church first. And then in verse 18 of 1 Peter chapter 4, it says, And if the righteous are scarcely saved, like, we are saved through the blood of Christ, but as far as from a worldly point of view, the way you look at it, that we just kind of got in by the skin of our teeth, it says, then where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Like if we were scarcely saved, then where are they going to appear? I mean, they're, they're going to be nowhere on the radar uh, of salvation because they have zero repentance. And so a church truly can be a bad witness to a community. Um, you know, there are people that are going to speak evil of believers, whether you do bad or not, you know, because even Paul said that we are known through good report and bad report. But it is important for us as best as possible to try to uphold our personal reputations. And so believers need to have that reputation of living for the Lord and being those that are honest and sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. And then pastors themselves, <clears throat> people like me, and other people in our church that are servants and, and ministry leaders, and we have two other pastors in our church, that, that it's all for us as well, that we would do our best to uphold our reputation and to live for Christ in this world and to be sincere and without offense toward God and man. And, and yet, it's not just the believer, and it's not just the pastors, but it's the church itself that ends up with a reputation based upon the loose reputation 
of those that serve or those that attend. And, and so if we have just really, we'll say, leaning on our own understanding, lighthearted decision-making, and we're not looking at things as scriptural criteria in, in right and wrong and, and things we're trying to do to move the church forward, we can have a negative effect, impact upon our community, which obviously we don't want to have. And um, th there was a church in South Korea, and it was a church with some very strange teaching. Um, I don't know specifically if they were a cult or not, but definitely um, the information known about them is they had a lot of interesting practices and secretive things. And, and it was a pretty large church in um, the country of um, South Korea. And it, it says here that a secretive church, the Shin Chianji Church of Jesus, if I pronounce that right, was at the epicenter of South Korea's coronavirus outbreak with about half of the country's total infections at 10,728 linked to its members. Over half of the people's infections in the country were leaked, linked to its members. Um, the CNN article said that illness was never accepted as a valid reason to miss services. Like at that church, you had to still go to church if you were sick. Um, and so then it says this religious group um, was being talked about by one of its former members with the last name of Kim. It says, this is an organization that took roll call, that he says, and everyone had to physically swipe in and out of services. Like you had a card that you had to swipe in and out, roll call. Imagine that, you guys. Come on. I mean, yeah, the Bible says to not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, but do you think that's overboard or what, right? And so they had to swipe in and out of services with a special card. Any absence was noted and followed up on. It says, the culture was, even though you're sick, you come in on Sunday, no matter what, you come in on Sunday. It says, if you're so sick that you can't come on Sunday, you have to come on Monday or Tuesday. And then they were told that masks were a disrespect to God during the outbreak. I mean, even wearing glasses, right? Because you're not supposed to, you're supposed to be at church whether you're sick and so, but, but masks, don't wear masks. It's a disrespect to God, they were told. And then they were responsible at that point for up to half of the outbreak in their own country. Now, do you think that that church, the people are going to remember them as being the church of offense and the church of the spread in that country? And, and so the point is, is that yes, individuals and pastors and churches, no matter what it is, that was just that modern day example that we're in right now. But I would say that um, it, it's, a, it's a crazy thing and that we have to ask the Lord, Lord, help me to be a personal good testimony. Help me to um, firm up the, the broken areas of my life. Help me to, um, you know, give over to you those areas that are a, a little bit um, wavering and, and, and the screwy parts of you that, that are not obedient to the Word of God but are rebelliousness in you. And are you, my brethren, the one who doesn't care or the one who really is taking your walk with the Lord seriously? And so... We should try as best as we can, uh, according to the ability within us to live peaceably with people, to try not to live with offense before our neighbors and before our family at church and before the people we work with and, and our own family members in our home. We should try our best to um, keep short records with God that even though, yes, the blood of Christ cleanses us of all sin, but that we're also confessing our sins and knowing that he's faithful and just to cleanse us. And it's like, oh Lord, forgive me of that. Oh Lord, forgive me of that. Oh Lord, a lot of oh Lords have huh, to forgive. And, um, and, and to do that as best as you can. It's not that you're, the more that you do it is the more that you're forgiven or the louder you do it is the louder that you're forgiven. But it means that you have a humble heart and that you're staying in tune with God and you, you feel that sense of tension between what's wrong and trying to get in that place of what's right, even though at the same time covering all of it is God's grace in, in, in working in you. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Philippians chapter 1, and it says in verse 9. It says, In this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. I, I'm praying that you guys would be really um, like a, what, what is it, a good witness 
in your community for love, a good witness in your family and a good witness in your church for love. And it says, and that you may approve the things that are excellent, that, that the decisions that you guys make as individuals and as pastors and as churches would be excellent decisions, non-offensive, things that would really impact in the proper way. And it says, and that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. And guess what? That day of Christ is coming to judge the whole world. And God wants us to be on our toes. He wants us to be alerted and ready until the day of Christ and making sure we're not being the foolish virgins, but the five wise, that we are without offense and that, that we're, we're, we're making it our aim. We're doing our best. We're, we're seeking to be that, that worthy person in that, approving the things that are excellent. And it says that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. And it says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 11, it says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. That your life would reflect the fruits of righteousness, the love, the joy, the peace, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, patience. All of those things would reflect Christ, that your life would bring praise to the glory of God. That, that's God's plan. And that we'd be known as the church of love. You know, one time um, somebody told me that. Um, you know, they, they said, your church is a church of love. And, um, and that was um, actually Chuck Smith said that to me. That he was the founder of Calvary Chapel. And, and I, and I like that. And uh, trying not to offend God and man. But say we do offend somebody. What do we do? How do we deal with it? How how do we clean that up? How do we go back and fix that? Especially since some people won't let it go. And will God let it go? Well, depends on how well you know him. He will. And so you you, you start with just, I'm sorry. I know some people try to minimize the name or the phrase, I'm sorry, because they think that that's not changing anything. But that, that really is a starting point is an apology. And Lord, you know, against you and you only. Have I, have I done this evil in your sight? You know, there was one time that I bothered my wife and, and brought um, mm, the scorn of my wife. And I had felt it and I had gone into the shower and I'm going, oh man, this is bad. And if I let her brew on it any longer, um, I'm going to have a harder time. And so I just like jumped out of that shower very quickly and went to my wife and I said, I didn't mean that. And that's not what I really, I, what I meant isn't really what I said. And I, and here's what I, what I meant, you know, and that little backpedaling thing that isn't a lie, but yet is more explanatory toward the truth of what you were thinking and, and cleaning things up. It, it's important. Um, some people are all into cleaning themselves up, right? The shower. No, no. It was cleaning up that relationship, that offense between my wife and I at that point. And, you know, and, and the fact is, is some people think, well, I don't need to say anything to her. It'll just fix itself. She'll just forget about it. But I would say that things tend not to fix themselves. And so if we know that we've hurt somebody, we've intentionally done something or unintentionally done something, that we have to check ourselves and make sure that we can straighten things out and and not just figuring, well, I had good intentions or I know what I meant. But, um, you know, just like we have to go to God and say, Lord, against you and only you. I, I've offended you. And so, you know, if I were to teach right now, backwards, okay, let's do that. I'm gonna teach you guys backwards. Okay, do you like this? Do you like it if I just turn my back on you the whole time and I'm just teaching you backwards? After a while, would you kind of get bothered by that? You know what I mean? I mean, some of you are going, oh, I kind of like his back. I think I like, I've never seen a pastor just teach from his back. But you know what? That that having your back on a person, um, people don't want to be talked to like that. People want to have face-to-face discussions. People want to see somebody's eyes. I mean, and they they want to, you know, understand where that person's coming from. And, And so if we apologize to another person, it shows that we're humble. It shows that we see the fact that we could do wrong. So if you were a person of sexual immorality in the church, And no matter what your struggle was on a a scale from one to 10, and whether it was a doozy or whether it was one of those um, incremental things that could build up toward that, um, it's very important that the, the, the repentance shows who you really are. It shows that you care about God. It shows that you care about others. It shows that you don't just sweep things under the carpet, right? And yet I will say that, um, 
there are sometimes people that take offense at everything, right? Would you just stop breathing? You're breathing so loud. Um, you know, if I stopped breathing, I think I'd, I'd be dead. Stop being offended at my breathing. I need to live. Uh, but sometimes people look at God as being offended by everything. He's that big judge in the sky that's going to put down the, the judge mallet on the, you know, stand, uh, at, the, at the judge's bench and say, guilty, guilty as charged. And, and so you're always feeling the sense of condemnation from God. And that, that's wrong too. I mean, you got to be able to give it over to God and trust that you gave it over to God and trust God enough that when he says he's mercy and full and compassionate, that, that you really believe that that's who he is. Um, and, and by the way, at the very beginning of the study, when I was quoting the scripture about um, Jesus being offended by Peter, that was, and I said Matthew 16, it was verse 23, by the way, um, when he said, you are an offense to me. And, and I hope that when it comes to sexual immorality, when it comes to things that can really, um, we'll say, get God fed up, I hope that we recognize how he thinks and how he feels and we're concerned about him. Not just ourselves, not just covering something over or looking good, but I hope that you have a concern out of your love for the Lord to try to really give that over to God against you and you only have I sent, as David said, to the Lord and done this evil in your sight. Now, there are some things that, you know, you can't get away from that are always going to be offense. For instance, the cross of Christ, is, it in of itself, the nature of it is an offense to the world. You know, that this man died for the sins of the world and you're walking in darkness and you need to come into his light and let his blood cleanse you. I mean, the, the world doesn't readily accept that because it tells them that they're wrong and God's right. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32, it says, Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Gentiles, I mean, or to the Greeks or to the church of God. So don't give offense to the Jews, okay? And, and the church was told um, in Acts 15 about not eating things that are strangled with the blood. There were certain even dietary things that were a big offense to the Jews and, and to the world, to the Greeks, and to the church of God. There are certain things... You know, and, and all of those scriptures about eating meat sacrificed to an idol and that we have to just kind of be careful because I remember when I was a young Christian, it was like um, Christian rock music. You know, is that of the devil or is it, um, you know, is it okay? And, and Christians have always had all kinds of wars. Right now, it's all about pol politics, right? There are so many Christians that are more into politics than they are into witnessing. And you look at their Facebook pages and everything, and it's more about, oh, look at this and look at that. And I'm not saying it's unimportant. And I'm not saying taking a stand is wrong. I'm just saying, you know, everybody has to look at themselves and look at that balance. And, and sometimes people do get imbalanced, don't they? Any of us can. And, and sometimes our Facebook pages just prove that we're imbalanced. And, um, but the balance is, is that the Lord is number one. And, Rather than offending men, oh, I don't care what anybody thinks. I know right is right. Well, but, you know, God talks about walking in love also and, and winning everybody that you could possibly win. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, it says, actually, verse 3, it says, We give no offense in anything. Wow, that's a pretty big measure. Anything. It says that our ministry may not be blamed. And, and Paul said that I coveted no man's gold or silver or apparel. He really sought to not be an offense. And so we know that we are light and that light dispels darkness. And that the darkness is always offended at the light because when the light is turned on, the darkness dissipates. And if you were darkness, you wouldn't want to dissipate. You would still want to be darkness and yet the light causes the darkness to go off into very small corners. And, and so the morning sun might dispel the fog. It might take the marine layer of Southern California and the heat will wear it away so then you can see the clear day. And, and this is what God does. His word does. Repentance does. Humility does with those things that are an offense that it begins to cause them to dissipate as we draw near to God. In Acts chapter 24, verses um, 15 through 17, it says, 
and this is, I, I believe Paul saying, forgot my own scripture, but um, Acts 24, 15, it says, I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept that there will be a resurrection of the dead. And yeah, it's Paul. It says, both of the just and the unjust. And there is going to actually be a physical resurrection. You, when the rapture occurs, maybe your dead relative who knew the Lord, their body is going to meet their spirit. And there's going to be a resurrection of the dead. It says, um, this being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and man. Our, our, our conscience, our, our inner man, our, our thoughts, our, our way of abiding in Christ and, and feeling that sense of um, being against God and against his word uh, without fully explaining conscience there. But, but he says, you know, I strive to have a good conscience. It says toward God and man. And it says, now after many years, I've come to bring alms and offerings to my nation. That the interesting thing with that scripture in the book of Acts is that Paul was practicing his Judaism, even though he was in the faith. And so he was doing Jewish things that a good Jewish guy would do. But as a result of not trying to offend Jew and not offend God through his Judaism, he actually um, put himself in a position that it created this big problem. In his life, but God used it for His glory, of course. Um, now, there are a lot of scriptures in the Bible that talk about things that happen in the church, things that are among you. Ephesians talks about certain lists of sins. It says, "Let it not even be named among you." And also, in Corinthians, it says, "Such were some of you," or it mentions certain things that says when those things that you once walked in. And so there is a point in time where there's got to be a change. There's got to be a turning over of things to God and that we can recognize that we might have offended the spirit of grace. Uh, the story of Ananias and Sapphira, <laughs> Sapphira, <laughs> Sapphira. That is funny. My wife's going to laugh at that one. Um, but we're going to say that story in the book of Acts, chapter 6, uh, or chapter 5. They lied to the Holy Spirit. They were an offense to God, and they were struck dead. I mean, that's how seriously the Lord took it. Oh, my goodness, what a story. Um, and, and then it would make you think, I don't want to be offense to God. I was listening to the one-year Bible this morning, and Abigail's husband, Nabal, was an offense to David. And he actually ended up having a stroke and then 10 days later God struck him dead and then in that same one year Bible it mentioned on Psalm 116 that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints so one man in his wickedness God strikes him dead but another man just has an appointment with God because it's precious in God's sight that they're going to meet him on their appointment day to um, hey I gotta get that appointment going with God um, we, we should not continue in our rebellion. There was a group of people who didn't welcome the people of God. I, I think it was the Moabites. And by the way, if you're going to fact check, learn all your stuff. It was one of those ites. And they didn't let the children of Israel come through. And so because of that, they weren't allowed in the temple of God. And, and so there are certain things that can actually close doors and put you out. And the Lord does not always strive with man when man wants to be hardened, stiff-necked, and rebellious. And in this particular case of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he was handing this guy over to Satan. Now, I will say if you're taking notes, some other extra scriptures are Hebrews chapter 10, verses 29 to 31. It talks about a person is thought worthy who's trampled the Son of God underfoot and counted the blood of his covenant by which he was sanctified as a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace. That is Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29 insulting the spirit of grace let's let's not insult that holy spirit um, we know the lord as a friend we know him as the lord of our lives but we don't want to know him as our foe and there was one of the early churches in the book of revelation and he told them repent in revelation 2 16 he says they're also i'm going to come to you quickly i'm going to fight against them with the sword of my mouth i'm going to fight against some people in this particular church who've made themselves my enemies. See, so people who think, you know, that he's 
angry with the wicked every day, but that he doesn't get angry with the church. Revelation mentions that particular thing, that there were those that weren't walking with the Lord. And so, um, one, one more scripture. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 3, it says, O Lord, are not your eyes on the truth? You have stricken them, but they have not grieved. You have consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than rock, and they have refused to return. So, my dear brothers and sisters, don't ever shrug your shoulders at God. Don't stop up your ears at God. Don't make your heart hardened before the Lord because it's not listening to the Spirit. And the Spirit says to us, if there is any of those things that are an offense to God, such as in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, such as sexual immorality, it needs to be repented of so the church can be purified and God's land will not be desolate or judgment upon it, but it will be um, beautiful and pleasant again. That would be God's plan. So don't refuse the Holy Spirit is who's speaking to your heart. Because even a believer, whether it be chastisement, whether it be judgment, or whether it be wrath, whatever level it is, um, will not escape if we refuse him who speaks to us from heaven, who shakes the earth. But at the same time, in the mighty righteous man falling seven times, and the Jonah, the word of the Lord came to him a second time, know that the Lord, when he died on that cross, and the anger of God was satisfied upon him, and the judgment of God was satisfied upon him. And so ultimately, you do need to hang out in that blood of Christ and what Jesus did for you. And, and even though you might have the fear of God, knowing that he is a consuming fire and considering yourself, but at the same time, falling into the arms of the living God who absolutely loves you and you can then serve him acceptably through his spirit. All right. Well, all of those things to say, um, we might offend God, we might offend man. This hat may have been an offense to you. My teaching you backwards for one second might have been a t um, offensive to you. My chewing gum in church may have been an offense, but you know, all of those things are so little in what people say are an offense compared to what God says is an offense. And so God help us. And let's pray about that now, okay? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord God, that, Lord, even though as believers we might fall short of the glory of God and we might find ourselves in places that we've never dreamed of or never hoped that we would be in. But Lord God, I know that for every believer that has found that falling short or has found that place of brokenness or has found that place of like, ugh, um, I was on the verge. And, and, and Lord, I thank you that you love them. I thank you, Lord, that you have freedom in Christ for them. I thank you, Lord, that they need to just always hold fast to you. I thank you, Lord, that you are able to clean up your church. But Lord, if there is something that we have to deal with in our own life or we have to deal with as a church and as leadership and as a congregation in gathering around in order to make sure, Lord, that you're happy with your church. Lord God, that we would have our church, First Love Calvary Chapel, as well as all the influencing churches that we have around us, Lord God, be those churches that you can just be so happy about, Lord, and, and not be offended by. And so we just um, give it all to you. We give our offenses to you, Lord. And, and if you have offenses, guys, just say, Lord, I am so sorry. I'm sorry, Lord, for that ugly junk that has offended you. I'm sorry, Lord, for that immorality. And I listed different names for immorality in the Bible earlier. And so you just put it, whatever name it is that you know that your, your offense is and say, Lord, I'm so sorry for that. And Lord, I really do want to turn and I really do want to return to you. And, and Lord, I, I don't want to walk in wickedness. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys. Well, um, if you need to ask Christ into your heart, please do so, okay? He died on the cross for you. Just say, Jesus, I repent of my sins. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Okay, you guys. Well, um, the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. And the Lord give you peace. And this Sunday, this Sunday, we're going to have a drive-in service at the back of the church. We're still going to have 9 o'clock 
will be um, online premiering. 10.30, um, we want everybody to get there by 10, so we can start at 10.30 on the dot. 10.30 will be a drive-in to the back of the church. Um, it, it obviously will be limited. And, um, and then that will also be live streamed. And so um, we just invite you guys. Um, and if hopefully we don't have to turn anybody away. All right, you guys, God bless you and have a wonderful, wonderful uh, either afternoon or evening. Okay, bye. Thank you, Lord, for how you meet us here today. You meet us in every moment, Lord. And we just want to give you our praise, Lord. Our thank yous, our adoration, God, because you're worthy. We love you, Lord. You give life.
Lord, thank you for how you have listened to our cries and our prayers, Lord, and that you are the great Lord who does all things in perfect wisdom, God, and we never have to, like, worry or question you, Lord, Um, but when our soul does question, Lord, you give us answers or you give us peace to trust that you are always in control. Um, So, Lord, we acknowledge that you are in every question and answer and not every question, Lord, because you are the author of peace and not of confusion, but you are there as a listener. Um, and every question you have, you, you listen, Lord. And um, thank you, God, that you are in, in every truthful answer because you are truth, God. Um, so I thank you so much for this time that we could come to you at your feet, Lord, and you are truth. And we sing your truth, Lord, and you opened our eyes in truth, God. Um, and so we pray for those who are blind to sin. We pray for those who are in bondage of sin, God, that you would just radiate their lives and in their lives, Lord, bring the light, bring truth, bring freedom. God, we love you because you have done those things in our lives already.
our days, God. And at the end of our days, Lord, we will return to you because all that we have is already yours, Lord. You've made us, and we'll return to you, Lord, and I just thank you. And so we want to give you our hearts even now as we still live, because it's yours, God. So let's sing, come and consume.
that we are your children, Lord, and that we never have to worry about our battles or because you fought them already for us. Lord, you give us the strength to endure. You give us the wisdom to go through it, God. And I thank you so much that you are our strength and you are our shield, Lord, and you are the fortress. You are the tower that we run to and we're made safe, Lord. Um, it doesn't matter what else, anybody else, any other label that's upon us, Lord, only what you call us by and what you call us as, Lord, we are yours and you are ours. God, thank you so much for this time to just stand and sing to you, Lord, to cry our hearts before you, God. And I pray that that worship was just for you, Lord, Lord, and that you received it, God. Thank you so much from our lips to your ears, Lord, that you listen and that your face is upon us, Lord. So thank you, God. We sing these things in your precious name. We sing these things in your holy and wonderful and powerful name, your just name. In Jesus' name, amen.